this becomes a debate, it's going to be good for us for a long time. Because this is a historic moment in American political life. First time in the history of this nation, a political party has chosen a Negro woman for the second highest office in the land. Now that didn't come from Camilla. I know some of y'all say, did he just call her Negro? No, you wait, just hold it. That's a quote by Shalotta Bass, who was the first black woman to own and operate a newspaper in the United States. And she spoke those words in 1952 when she was the first black woman to be nominated as the vice president of the United States. She was a nominee of the Progressive Party. And her slogan was, win or lose, we win by raising the issue. So this nomination, I need not even about partisan, the substance, the historical substance, this nomination is bigger than partisan politics. But it also help, is going to force us to wrestle with, for every black woman who will make it into the halls of Congress or white, the White House, there are many others who will be left to struggle in the streets, and they must be heard too. If the vineyard is going to be right. And if the Democrats will resist or whoever will resist being worried about being political centrists, but about putting justice and moral revolution at the center and embrace the politics of God, the politics of the kingdom of heaven, the politics, if you will, of the deepest values of our constitution. And if they understand this, then this could be a truly transformative political moment. Love and welcome once again to the Greenleaf Christian Church Sunday morning worship celebration. I greet you first of all in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I greet you on behalf of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. William Joseph Barber II, and the Greenleaf Christian Church family. It's just an honor to be able to come into your living rooms, your bedrooms, your dens, your hospital rooms, wherever you may be listening to us at on Sunday mornings and share in a worship celebration. Amen, amen, amen. And to receive your prayer requests as you send them to us and to make you aware of things that are going on in our church community. Well, let me tell you, on this past week, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we had our Vacation Bible School 2020, and I'm telling you, it was wonderful. We thank all of you who joined us and who got your children on with us. If you missed it, you can check it out once again on our church website and on our Facebook page. Our teachers were just wonderful. We continued our journey through the Psalms for the adult portions of it. Reverend Dr. Barber and Reverend Dr. Della did the Psalm 17 through 19, and it was something other amazing and energetic. Our praise and worship was led by our own Minister of Music, Elder Ronzel Bell, and we hope we can get him back on some Wednesday nights for our regular Bible study. Sister Sheila had magnificent visuals for the young folk on Friday night as we talked about let your light shine as the little ones are getting ready to go back to school. We did Matthew 5. She and I did verse 14 through 16. And then Bishop had on Thursday night some straight talk with the 12 through 18 year olds. And you know they were kind of quiet but nevertheless he taught on if you don't know now you know. So please join in to that. You know we're so grateful for being able to have this avenue to be able to continue to share the gospel. We did Zoom and our online minister, Reverend, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Minister Stephen Knight took care of that for us and he did a phenomenal job. We are growing and continuing to do what we say we do and that is to show you the love of God. Amen. So we want to talk about some of our upcoming events as the slide is coming up. Again, we invite you to our Bible study on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. We have our member check-in. Uh, check and then at 7.15, we go live with any and everybody who desires to be there as a part of the Bible study. And everybody is welcome. We also have our prayer 
and devotion is going to be this Friday morning at 6 a.m. It's led by Deacon Grady Deloach and Reverend Dr. Della McKinnon. The call-in number is not on that screen, so I'm going to slow down and read it for you or give you the numbers and the access code so you can write it down. The number is 605-313-5071 or 5071. Read it again. 605-313-5071. And the access code is 988 Two one one pound sign sign. The access code is nine eight eight two one one pound sign. Please join us this Friday and every first and third Friday for our morning prayer and devotion at six a.m. Revival, revival, revival. August thirtieth through September the first. We will be having our revival, and the theme is Live, Breathe, and Be, a call to action for believers. The revivalists are the Reverend Dr. Cynthia Hale, Senior Pastor of Ray of Hope Church, Christian Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, the co-chair for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. And the Reverend Dr. Freddie Haynes, Senior Pastor of Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Be looking for more information on our website and our Facebook page in the coming week. We will also be celebrating Friends and Family Day on September the 7th. Bishop will be preaching and we will have Holy Communion. Members will have opportunity to come by on Saturday and pick up your communion elements for the Sunday communion. And finally, we will have our family month all of the month of September and each Wednesday night will be dedicated to addressing another issue for families for their concerns and issues that they are dealing with our next slide is on our giving as you know our pastor has said that giving is not our main focus as we have been blessed to be able to continue to do this but we are so grateful for our members who have been faithful with their tithing and their giving. And for those of you who have seen that this is good soil and continue to sow into this ministry. If you want to give, the information for giving is there on the screen. You know, we have been saying that our zip code is 27530. Well, Brother Melvin works with the postal services and he informed me that we were wrong. So we want to make sure that your Gifts get to us appropriately. So the zip code is 27533. 27533. And you should send it to P.O. Box 597 if you choose to use the postal services. If you want to donate directly, you can go to our website, www.greenleafchristian.doc.org. O -R -G. And you can go to the donate, donate, I keep saying donut, the donate button, press it, and there behind that you will find a connection to PayPal where you can donate that way should you choose to do it that way. Please know that all of your gifts are greatly appreciated and they will be used appropriately. Our next slide is about our WFMC radio broadcast. Last Sunday was our first Sunday. We will be on each Sunday at 7.15 for 45 minutes. Please know that it will not be our Sunday morning message, but it will be one of the messages for previous Sunday, probably the Sunday before. So please tune in if you happen to not be able to get the word at that time. Tune in at 7.15 and the word will be available for you at that time. Amen. Next slide, Brother Corey. Again, if you have prayer requests, please send them into our email. Please go on our Facebook page. We just don't want you to give to us. We are here to be able to help you and to stand in the gap. With that being said, we also, as we prepare to go into prayer, want to lift those who are on our recovery list. Deacon James Harris, Mother Della McCullough, Mother Lily King, Sister Maureen Jones, Brother Elliot Duke, 
Sister Vicki Cawthon, for those who are undergoing treatment for cancer, and for those who are experiencing cardiovascular difficulties at this time, we want to lift them up as well as their caregivers and loved ones. And the last slide. We want to invite you to participate in the Moral Monday Digital Direct Action on McConnell. The Moral Monday Digital Direct Action on McConnell. It will be this Monday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We want to save the post office. If you've been following the news, you know the things that are being done to oppress and to hinder our vote. So we want to save the post office and save lives. Demand that something is done to help our people who are suffering now because of this pandemic, who have been already victims of the pandemic of racism and the pandemic of poverty. And we can do something about it by being a part of events such as this. It is our duty, our obligation as Christians, as our brother and sister's keeper, to participate. So let us go into prayer. Thank you for being so attentive to the announcements. Let us go into prayer as we welcome into this space, in this place, the presence of the Lord. We know that he's already here. The Lord is already here because we're two or three are gathered together in his name and we are continuing to social distance. We don't have but just a few people here, but we are gathered in his name. His promise is that he would be in the midst. And after that, we're going to go into our praise and worship and then to the word of God. Amen. Amen and amen again. Gracious and eternal God. We thank you for yet another day. We thank you for how you watched over us, Lord, as we slept and, and we slumbered. We thank you, God, that we were fortunate enough, some of us, to lie under roofs and to lie in beds and to rest on last night. But we dare not forget our brothers and sisters, Lord, who were tormented by storms, who have been displaced by floodwaters, who have been displaced by winds and rain, who have been displaced, oh God, by poverty. We remember our brothers and sisters who are still yet sleeping under bridges, those who are hiding in the woods, those who are having to sleep in cars, and for those who are experiencing this for the first time, Lord, we remember them this morning. We thank you, oh God, that you will continue to make ways for them and that you would use us, God, even to do that. We thank you this morning for an opportunity to exercise our limbs and giving thanks to you, Lord. We lift our hands in your presence, oh Lord. We lift our voice and we lift our eyes into the hills from which cometh all of our help. Our help comes from you, Lord, and you've not failed us yet, God. We thank you this morning for an opportunity, Lord, to go over the airways. We don't take it lightly, oh God, and be able to proclaim that you are still good in the midst of all that is going on. You are still good in the midst of sickness. You are still good in the midst of hard times. You are still good in the midst of all that is going on, Lord. You are still good and you're worthy of all the glory, honor, and the praise. God, there is so much to tell you thank you for this morning, yes, Lord. Yes. We have so much that we can be grateful for, Lord. Sometimes we tend to focus on the things that are negative, Lord, and we don't ignore them. We know that they are there, but we know, God, that if we would give thanks in all things, then we could make our requests known unto you, Lord, and you would incline your ear to our cry, God. So we give you thanks and praise on this morning. We thank you for Green Leaf Christian Church. And we thank you for every member of this branch of Zion, Lord. We thank you for the body of Christ at large, Lord. And we thank you for pastors everywhere. We pray that you would undergird them and anoint them afresh, God. We pray for this government, oh Heavenly Father. You said that we ought to pray for those who are leading us and who have rule over us, God. We thank you, Lord, that they can do no more than what you allow. And God, right now, there's so much division and divisiveness in this country, Lord. There is so much going on to undermine this and to uphold this, God. We ask that you would help us to focus, Lord, and to see what it is that you would desire us to see and to do what it is that you would desire us to do. Oh, God, on this morning, we ask you to saturate this place, that the preaching of the word might be made easy, God. 
We thank you for the sowing of the seed and for the rain that you will send to water it, O oh God, that you might receive the increase. We yes. take no glory, honor, and praise for ourselves, O oh God. Hallelujah. But we give it all to you, Lord, for you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, God. Now, Lord, anoint us even the more for your service, O oh Lord, Jesus. that we might be vessels in this earth, O oh God. Beacons of light, Lord, that somebody might be able to see the way to salvation, to see the way to hope, see the way to healing. We give you glory, honor, and praise for just being the great God that you are. <laughs> And now, oh God, as we prepare to enter into this time of worship in song, we ask that you would have your way. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In the name of your son, Jesus, we do pray. Amen and amen. Amen, amen, amen. Bye. 
where you are in your home, in your car, if you're in your car driving, just pull over a second if you can. If you're listening at the computer, I want you to sing that line with us. Praise the name of Jesus, our salvation. The one who has come and came to preach good news to the poor and recovery of sight to the blind and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Just as we move into that place of meditation, as you've heard our assistant pastor lift up the prayers of so many, in this place we have our weekly celebration. We celebrate God even as we cry over ungodly situations and we challenge them. But we know that our God is with us, whether it be in cross times or good times, whether it be on dark Fridays or Sunday morning resurrections, our God is with us. And I give you a report, not just from those who have, who seem to be faring well, but I've been among people who are in deep distress, but they still are calling on the name of Jesus. They're marching in the name of Jesus. They're standing in the name of God. Amen. Because God indeed is our strength and our rock. So come on. Praise the name of Jesus. Right where you are. Come on, come on. You may have had loss. You may have had hurt. You may not know exactly which way to turn. But raise the name. Praise the name of our God. God is our rock. He's, my fortress. He's a fortress strong and a strong deliverer. deliverer. In him will I trust. Come on, let's raise our voices. Praise God. It is in your name, O oh God, in your purpose, in your plan, and in your character, and in your way that we come. We don't just say your name, God. We serve your way. We try to serve and live in your purpose and in your will. For when we have miserably failed, forgive us, O oh God, we repent and thank you for not abandoning us. Thank you, Lord. In the midst of these difficult days, we trust your way. Though the world's way is raging, and though sometimes it looks like the wicked are prevailing and there is not even the sound of sadness in their grief but Lord we know it is not so and so we praise your name and we trust and stay in your way for those God who are not isolated not only isolated in this pandemic but who are facing isolations of pain and sickness and hurt and problems not even related to the pandemic you know oh God and you've promised to be a very present help yes, yes. in the time of trouble. Enable us to be still and know that you're God. And know that stillness is not merely non-movement. But stillness in you is serving you and trusting you. And leaning into your holy presence. We need a refuge in these moments. And thou art that refuge. 
We need a place to stand that does not shift and thou art that rock. We don't just need deliverance, we need strong deliverance. Yes. Yes, God. The kind of deliverance that comes when we have almost given up on the possibility of it happening. And so we praise your name. Now, God, we come in this moment of preaching and teaching and hearing, and we know that whenever you call men and women to preach, teach, you take this risk of putting treasure in trash, treasure in an earthen vessel, a vessel of clay, a vessel of weakness, a vessel of frailty. But you do it because when all is said and done and when your word goes forth and when lives are lifted and hearts are set free and minds are delivered through your word, the excellency of it goes to you. The excellency of the power goes to you and not to us. So if you would, God, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and blessed Redeemer, come Holy Spirit, come with preaching, teaching, and hearing power. In Jesus' name, amen. I am Holy Ghost happy to be able to be here on this morning with all of you who are joining us from around the country. I also want to thank the people Many of you who are out there, uh, you don't know. It means a lot when you send a text in and say the, the cross chain was hitting the mic. That lets me know you're paying attention. And it gives us an opportunity to make adjustments. Um, I'm one of the kind of people that likes a friend that will help me make an adjustment when I need to rather than just let me go on and uh, not say that something needs to shift, so we thank you. We honor all of the proper members, what we call in proper, who are here in Goldsboro and other that are members of this congregation. But all of you who've joined us some four months now from around the world, I want to give a shout out to um, our friends in the United Kingdom who show up every Sunday morning and in Ireland, those of you who show up. And our continued brothers and sisters from Canada and Tanzania, uh, those that we know um, who join us from Arizona and from Alabama. Am I okay, Corey, with the crackling? If, if I'm not, somebody text Cheryl and tell her. Um, but um, those from Michigan and Mississippi, uh, all over the world, we even had someone tune in from the Netherlands. And we thank God uh, for all of you and for your prayers. I hear some crackling. I'm not sure what that is in the system. And I want to make sure it's not out there. So if anybody's out there and you text Cheryl and make sure everyone else there, make sure you're not hearing it. We've been working through the Gospel of Matthew, Micah prophets of Micah and uh, Malachi, but I've been led to just hunker down in Matthew. And somebody texted me the other day, what are you preaching in these times? I said, what I've been preaching. <laughs> because God's word is timeless. Amen. And um, we don't have to run all over the scriptures. Um, God's word is always in season. That's why he told us to preach it in season and out of season. In fact, the matter is, 75% uh, of the Bible was written in times of great stress. Uh, all of the prophets, they wrote in times either people were in exile, headed toward exile, or coming out of exile. When the Gospels were written and penned, the disciples were under siege, on the run. People were trying to kill them. Most of Paul's letters, when he was in jail, he was like many of our prisoners today, in jail, and they were not the best place when it came to cleanliness. Uh, 
But yet, even there, God spoke to him and he spoke to the people. The last book of the Bible, Revelations, John was thrown on an island of isolation called Patmos. He was thrown there in hope that either he would die or that the other criminals that were there before him would kill him. And we know Jesus lived 33 years, if you will, in the flesh. And every one of those years had its challenges. From the time he was born, when a Herod-like king wanted to kill him, and to the time of the ending when Caesar, Pilate, and the forces of extremism used the, used the weaponry of the state to crucify him. So the Bible is born for trouble. <laughs> the word of God is right. And I like when the old folk used to say, and it's right right now. <laughs> and so I want to just move. There is a word from the Lord, I believe, in the next chapter in Matthew, the 20th chapter. The next chapter we've been working through, the 20th chapter in the gospel according to Matthew. And it reads like this in the NIV. And if you have it, Corey, you can um, put it up. Um, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius, a day's wage, and he sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go to work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. He went out again about five in the afternoon. He went out and he found still others who were standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? They said, because no one has hired us. And he said, well, you go and work in my vineyard. Verse 8, when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages. But I want you to start with the last ones hired and then go to the first. The workers who were hired about 5 o'clock in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius, what was right for a day's wage. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. Verse 13, but he answered one of them, I am am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the ones who were hired last the same as I gave you. And don't I have the right to do what, or don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? And are you serious? Are you envious because I've decided to be generous and full of grace? Verse 16, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. I want to talk and labor a little bit this morning on the subject, politics done right. God's way. Now, there are probably about 15 sermons in that one story. Uh, There's pastoral word, there's prophetic word, there's a priestly word, there's all kinds of 
things, even as I was reading it, that were beginning to birth in my spirit. But I want to focus this morning, may come back to it next week, politics done right God's way. Walter Fontroy, who worked with Dr. King and was in D.C., great preacher, was there when Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Walter Fontra used to say time and time again, politics is about who gets what, when, where, and how. You know, at the end of the day, he said politics is about money. Politics, people run for office, most, many people do, especially extremists. They run for office, extremists do, to take the money. Some people run because they want to spread the money and help people, but at the end of the day, the United States Congress is like a bank. County commissioners are banks. City councils are banks. If you read the charters that, that call them into existence, the state government is like a bank. Their main work is budget. And a budget is a moral document because wherever your heart is. That's where your treasure is. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Wherever, whatever you value, you'll give to it. And so a budget really tells who you are and what you are, regardless of what you say. Just some time ago, a lady, I was counseling with her and her husband, and they were trying to work through some things. And I asked her what the problem was. The guy seemed to be pretty handsome. He seemed to be, you know, a gentle spirit for what I could see. She said, but pastor, romance without finance is a nuisance. <clears throat> and he just won't do nothing. <laughs> and, he, and he won't bring anything to the table. And all those words about I love you are so empty. Marriage is kind of politics, too. And it's not always 50-50. Sometimes it's 70-30. <laughs> but whatever it is, everybody is required to bring something to the table. By politics here, I don't mean Democrat and Republican. I'm talking about this whole notion of how we get along and move. This story, this story Jesus told, and interestingly, he did not say it was a parable. Not in this text. He said... I want to tell you a story. This story is told to give a picture of what God's politics done right looks like. This story is to show us the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It wants us to see what is the mindset, the ethos, the ethic of the Holy Spirit. This story is trying to show us what the kingdom of heaven looks like or should look like here. Not in the afterlife, but what faith lived out is supposed to look like now. What the church, if you will, what people who love God are supposed to be working out now, how God sees things and wants us to see things. This text is about how following Jesus is supposed to adjust all of our perspectives, politically, economically, spiritually, culturally. It's a text about how our way of living and acting and how we see the world when we've been caught up in the kingdom of God. And it's a troubling text. We recall at this text. The landowner, the first clue is uh, the vineyard owner, he has power. And he has wealth. He has land. He had a vineyard. And there's nowhere in the text that says he was in great need of workers. 
great need of new employees. But something was going on, something moved in him, and he decided not to just sit on his wealth or rest in his power. This landowner, this vineyard owner, this person of means and wealth, he decided to use his power to hire people, period. Because they needed it. No long interview. It's almost as though he looked out and saw people who were God's humanity doing nothing and he knew that whatever had caused them to be in a position of having nothing to do was not right and he had the power to do something. So he did it. (laughs) He didn't even know uh, them, but they needed a job. They needed resources. They needed a lifting. Maybe they had just come through a pandemic or were in the midst of it. We don't know. But he used his power to bring people into his vineyard. Now, last week, the text said it's hard for a rich man or a rich nation to enter the kingdom of heaven. But I reminded you last week that the scripture says it's hard but not impossible. And last week, we saw it was hard. Because when a young rich man in the text last year, he had his wealth, his vineyards, if you will, his means. But when he was told to give (laughs) and lift up others and follow God's way, he just couldn't. Even though he was being offered, the text taught us last week, to literally be in the inner circle of Jesus, he just couldn't. I just can't bring myself to use my wealth to help other people. It's mine. But this landover, this rich man, used his power and his wealth to give to the unemployed poor and the workers who needed a living wage job because they needed it. He said, I don't know why so many people were out there unemployed. I know it's a whole lot in America right now. I know that even when unemployment is 8% in America, it's way over 10, 15% sometimes in black America and brown America and even higher among indigenous people. What I know is that there are a whole lot of people that work every day for less than a living wage. Let me put a parenthesis there. That's one of the reasons why I struggle with churches, especially if the church has the means when they try to pay their employees the least amount, but then want to fight for living wage from the businesses in the world. Churches ought to be the most gracious people. We ought not try to find somebody to clean our church on the cheap. This is all in parentheses. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who, who can do it the cheapest? No, 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 no. The kingdom of heaven doesn't work like that. It says he paid them a living wage of what was right. And he gave them a job because they needed it. Now, here is where this parable trips us up. Can I teach you a while? We come to every text because of the way we've been conditioned. And we want to say that the laborers are providing a mutual service to the landowner. In other words, he's paying them because they're doing something, and what they're doing is worth what he's paying. And I suspect that the people who first read this text read it and were tempted to read it like that because that's the way we think in the kingdom of this world. When we're realists, you know, we reduce, one writer says, human interactions to self-interest. We don't just believe 
that people can sometimes do something for you just out of love. I don't know how many times I have tr tried to give somebody something and they just feel like they have to give me something back. <laughs> you know? We're just prone like that. That's why it's so hard sometimes for folk to understand God's amazing grace. Because we're just conditioned to think there's no way God would love us like that. <laughs> and it messes up, up with a lot of real friends. That's why we end up having so many phony friends. Because if we ever get a real friend who just tries to love us unconditionally, tries to love us, we tend to think something wrong with them. <laughs> They're naive or something. Because we are prone to reduce it to if somebody's doing something for somebody, it has to be self-interest. I never will forget when I was pastoring the first congregation and we had some people in a church that did not have homes and we went out and worked to find a way for them to get homes and I went to one of the sisters who didn't have a home, her family didn't have a home, and shared with them that we had worked out a situation for them to get a home because they needed a home. And she, she literally got mad with me and said, what you getting out of it? I was like, I already got a house. I'm not getting anything. Yet. Well, there's got to be, there's got to be something. Just, just, she could not believe, Cheryl, that somebody could literally see her as a creation of God and just didn't have any other self-interest in it. It was all God interest. I'm just trying to do right. And so we tend to think if something is real economic exchange, then there's got to be something in this for the landowner. There's no way in the world this landowner is going to give like this. But Jesus' parable is not about a landowner looking for help from others as much as it is about a landowner who decides to help others. That's the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a mindset where you're not always looking to pimp somebody. You're not always looking for what you can get out of them. It's about agape love. It's about loving folk because they need to be loved. It's about reaching people. The landowner, this is about a landowner who's not getting something right back. It's about a landowner that says, I may not even necessarily need to hire some people, but in this time, in this moment of struggle, whatever it is that's causing all these folk to be without work, I'm going to do it. I, you know, this, this is about God saying, I don't need salvation. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in heaven. I, I'm perfect in and of myself. I, I can have community with myself the Holy Spirit and my son, us, we, let us make a world. But there's something in my godness yes. <laughs> that, that, that makes me let the rain shine on the just, I mean, pour on the just and the unjust and the sun shine on the just. And there's something in my godness that when I see a need, even if they don't want it, I'm going to bless them. It's called amazing grace. This, is, this, this story is trying to teach us about the kingdom of heaven by showing us a landowner who says, look, I'm going to go to all of these idle people, these people that society has just let sit wherever they are, and I'm going to give them a purpose, a place, and provision just because I can. Notice that at the interview, he doesn't say, now, I'm going to hire you, and if you're the best worker, then I'll keep you, and if you're not, I'm going to throw you away. I know this is messing with our minds, but grace always messes with our minds. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, I'm going to use what God has given to me to give to others. And there's a great trust in that, just like with God. God really believes that if we would ever understand grace, it's kind of like living holy. You don't live holy to get God's grace, you live wholly in response to God's grace. It's a whole different way of operating in the kingdom. You really don't sit around and try to check off, did I do this, did I do this, did I did this, so I can earn my way with God. What you really do is you say, God did this, 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 I didn't deserve this, God did this, God did this. So what can I do just to say, Lord, I love you? 
This shows that this landowner understood that what he had was just was not attained alone. Think about this landowner. This landowner was a giver of grace because he knew he was a recipient of grace. It's the reason why he's described as not just a landowner but a vineyard owner. But the very fact that it's a vineyard tells us he couldn't have had great vineyards on his own. The success of his vineyard, the success of things growing was not just in his hand. When you grow things, you move by faith. First of all, when you grow something, you got to put it under dirt where you can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> and what you grow, what you plant, you got to believe God has the power to bring it up from under the dirt. And when it comes from under the dirt, it'll be different than what you planted. Yeah. And yet the same thing. <laughs> when you have a successful vineyard, it ain't nothing but the grace of God. Because if the rain didn't come, if the sun was too hot, or if the locusts came along, there's no more vineyards. So this man understands that I'm a vineyard owner because of grace. And if I've received all this grace, in the kingdom of heaven, grace begots grace. This man saw himself as the recipient of grace to show grace. He couldn't just sit in what he had. He had to share it. Watch this. He had to make the community better. Because he would not have a great vineyard without the community. No vineyard owner fixes all of his vineyard. Somebody had to help him. And oh, that the church would never forget this. And pity us. If we do, pity us if we ever forget that we're not in God's church, God's people, because of our meritorious, because of our meritorious ability. <laughs> we're here because of the grace of God to show grace. And terrible is the church that becomes a place of rules and not a place of relationship. Terrible is the place that becomes a church of great grief and not grace. But here is the other part of that ugliness. Sometimes a place that teaches people that we're better than other folk, we're not like them, we're more holy than them, can actually be attractive because it's down in our sin-broken souls to want to believe we are in God because of who we are, not because of who God is. So that's attracted to it. That's why you have to be born again. <laughs> Your mindset has to be changed because the tendency is to think that we're doing God a great favor. Mm -hmm. But not only in the church, what kind of vineyard our nation would be if our politics, our concepts of power were done right God's way. Mm. Too often, however, the truth of the matter, we have a messed up vineyard in America. Mm. And a mess, some messed up landowners and some messed up ways of understanding power and wealth. When I look, took economics, I found out that there are theories of businesses, business that actually teach that after Businesses and people of wealth receive benefits from so much grace. See, anybody that's wealthy, the economists say have, they have benefited from what they call the renter society, where the wealthy get the people who are not wealthy to build all the things they need in order to produce their wealth. <laughs> Let me see if I can make this list. Any business owner, like tech companies in it, they need people who understand and know how to do tech. Well, that means they need schools built by the public and public universities to train people to work in their business, which means their business does not work without the public investing in public education. 
which is why it's so evil that once you get wealth, you didn't want to cut public education. <laughs> because, because you wouldn't have a business unless you, uh, without having rented from what was created by the public. Huh? There's not a person of wealth, there's no such, there's not a person of wealth, there's not a company of wealth that has become that way without using what has been built by the people and the grace of God. There's no such thing as pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's a, it's a lie. And yet I learned in economics that there are theories of business that says use everything you can to get all the wealth you can but then this is how you measure your success CEOs are often rewarded for the least amount of people they hire <laughs> there's a whole business theory that's what McConnell and, and them meant when they said we got to get these people off unemployed because they're making more money on unemployment than they are at work. They were actually indicting themselves. What they said is, this is not how it's supposed to work, even though what they said was not true. What they also were saying was, our understanding of business is you hire the least amount of people to get the most amount of work at the lowest price. And that's a messed up vineyard. And then I found out when I studied economics that there are many places that reward CEOs and presidents by how many people they lay off and still get the work done. They actually get bonuses and big stock portfolios and rewarded for laying folk off, even in a time of prosperity. And this, my friends, is not the kingdom of heaven. And it should not be an attitude in the church, how many people can we push out, neither should it be in the world. This is the kingdom of hell. Not the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of hell. And it causes untold misery and all kinds of hell in people's lives. It's a sick, twisted, vineyard owner mentality. And I must report this morning that in far too many ways, America is a twisted vineyard and a sick society with a whole lot of bad vineyard owners. Truth is, this pandemic has revealed the pandemonic of politics the wrong way. The, too many of the folk in charge of America or this American vineyard today, rather than hiring people purpose and provision and, 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 and extending grace, they want to give tax breaks to boost their own profits. Pay people less than a living wage while CEO pays go, goes up. Somebody said, well, why is the stock market so high and people are hurting so much? Because all of the tax cuts, when the wealthy got that, especially the greedy, they then took that money and rather than giving people jobs, they bought their own stocks and increased the stock prices and caused the stocks to rise with your money. The folk in charge of the vineyard who want to get bailed out by the government when a pandemic hits, but then they don't want to get people bailed out. There are people who want to have the government. You realize over these last few months, the government has covered the payroll of corporations while corporations have pushed people back to work in lethal situations. You heard it right. The gov we have paid the payroll of businesses who have billions of dollars in reserve. Or in this vineyard, people have been blamed who are on unemployment for not going back to jobs that don't even exist anymore. 40% of the jobs that make less than $40,000 are gone. Or we have vineyard owners who are actually right now, they say, we want immunity from lawsuits 
after we have profited off of the reckless behavior that killed people's loved ones. In other words, we know we were putting people at risk. We know some of them have died because we didn't give them the right PPEs. But you know, that would have cost us another dime or another quarter. And we, we have to keep all our money. That's the, that's the kind of vineyard we want. Not a vineyard that shares, but a vineyard that, that, that keeps. And now, they say, and now that we have caused people to die, we want the law to change to say those people cannot sue us. In the vineyard is sick, people make money off the pandemic. And here's a real sick one, Cheryl. Right now, there's a goal to make money off the vaccine. You see, the scientists that are working on the vaccines come from the schools funded by the public. Even if they're private schools, private schools get public money. Private, stu- private schools still will take your Pell Grant. <laughs> they get public money. Private schools get public money. But now they're saying, even if the scientists come from the schools that hard-working people created through their struggle and their sweat, if we get a vaccine, we want people to pay. In fact, we won't pay for even doing the research. And if we don't get the vaccine, we still want to make money for trying. This is not politics done the right way, but this is the politics the wrong way. This is not the kingdom of heaven, it's the kingdom of hell. And whether it's in society or it's in church, whenever we push people aside so that a few can have, that is not the kingdom of heaven. And that's why as we go into this political convention this week, one this week, one next week, the question for the church and the faithful is what kind of vineyard do these campaigns put forth? What is their vision for the vineyard? That's what I'm listening for. What is their vision? What is their vision for the vineyard? What kind of vineyard? What kind of America? Are they going to be politics the right way, God's way, or the wrong way? How will you try to lead the vineyard? Will you operate in your politics from a perspective of grace or greed? In fact, this is a real point. And the real point about selection, even the selection of Kamala Harris. I love that she's a black woman. Black woman with Caribbean, Indian woman connection. Serious. And the fact that she got had roots in the Caribbean, if, if I had time, I'd tell you how the Caribbean slave trade was even worse than the American slave trade in some ways because that was the first stop on the slave triangle. And it was in the Caribbeans that they did everything they could to break the slaves before they ever came to America. And our brothers and sisters that survived the Caribbean slave trade survived some of the most brutal, some of the most brutal, some of the most brutal and vicious parts of the slave trade. And that, that sister had roots. <laughs> And people that survived that. And, and then the Indian people, if you know about Gandhi, and this battle for the Indian people and the caste system of poverty and how they had to fight the British Empire. That's the root she comes out of. She's a black woman, and, 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 and her blackness represents people of color from all around the world. A black woman with all of that born in California, Mr. President. I, I know why you're scared of her. <laughs> I would too if she was running against me. <laughs> but she's show sure enough a black woman. <laughs> she represents black women and women of color that have built coalitions with white women of conscience and Latino women of conscience and native women of conscience down through history. I'm glad of that. I'm also glad that she's a sorority sister. Uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha, the first one founded at Howard, 1908, two years before, excuse me, one year before the NAACP, 12 years before women had the right to vote, or that is white women, born right in the middle of the time when black men were being lynched on an average of one per day. And I'm glad that she has 100% voting, oh Lord, 100%, let me take this, 100% voting record, cut cut the uh, little mic off. 100% voting record, 
for the NAACP, the ACLU, and labor unions. And I'm glad I know her as a friend. I'm, it's not an endorsement. I'm just telling you what I know. I'm glad I know her as a friend and, and have had the privilege to pray with her and meet with her. But what I'm most glad about is that her choice represents the possibility of raising questions about this American vineyard. And I want to talk to you in, right now, not about Democrat or Republican, but Republican, but about what this, the debate now could be. And if this becomes a debate, it's going to be good for us for a long time. Because this is a historic moment in American political life. First time in the history of this nation, a political party has chosen a Negro woman for the second highest office in the land. Now, that didn't come from Camilla. I know some of y'all say, he, did he just call her Negro? No, you wait, just hold it. That's a quote by Shalotta Bass, who was the first black woman to own and operate a newspaper in the United States, and she spoke those words in 1952 when she was the first black woman to be nominated as the vice president of the United States. <laughs> Two years before the Brown versus Board of Education decision. She was a nominee of the Progressive Party. And her slogan was, win or lose, we win by raising the issue. So this nomination, I need not even about partisan, the substance, the historical substance, this nomination is bigger than partisan politics. But it also help, is going to force us to wrestle with, for every black woman who will make it into the halls of Congress or white, the White House, there are many others who will be left to struggle in the streets, and they must be heard too if the vineyard's going to be right. And if the Democrats will resist, or whoever will resist, being worried about being political centrist, but about putting justice and moral revolution at the center and embrace the politics of God, the politics of the kingdom of heaven, the politics, if you will, of the deepest values of our Constitution, and if they understand this, then this could be a truly transformative political moment. There's 74 million women right now who were poor and low income before COVID. Probably 100 million now since COVID. And if these women, regardless of their color, if they hear this week or if they see in, in, in a particular ticket, not only the face of a woman, not only the face of diversity, black and white, but if they see a focus on issues that will change the vineyard, that, 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 that is saying we want everybody in and nobody out, then it could create a turnout that fundamentally changes what's possible in American politics. The vineyard could shift. Lord have mercy. If, 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 this, if a coalition comes together and ends up in Washington and ends up in this various states that, that, that says, listen, we, we're going we, to make sure low wage and workers and essential workers are paid right we're going to bring more. We're going to create more jobs for them. And, 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 and knowing that the majority of them are women and women of color, then I'm telling you, this could mean something. If the vineyard changes mm, and new people are brought in to ensure opportunity and uplift, the vineyard changes who and how this nation runs. And the truth of the matter is, this had nothing to do with Democrat or Republican. I'm just talking history. When you connect black women lawyers Executive, uh, for instance, in the suites of power with the cause of justice and the sisters of conscience fighting to live and thrive as a political force. Look, in other words, if you put Mary McLeod Bethune and Fannie Lou Hamer in the same room, good God from Zion, if you can get my mama in the same room with the sister saying, get your knee the hell off my son's neck and my daughter's neck and my neck, change is inevitable. The vineyard owner knew it. 2,000 years ago. And the question is, does America know it today? But then there's a second insight as I rush, rush on. Verse 4 says, he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. You hear that? The landowner used his power to pay what was right. Not what was cheap. Not what would get him over. Not what was unjust. But what was right? What was right was truly daily wage. And he said to those who tried to raise the question about how much it cost, 
and that it costs too much, he said to them, verse 14, take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired the last, the same I give you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Are you envious because I'm generous? In other words, this is my vineyard. The landowner knew something about grace. He knew grace is not cheap. Grace might be free, but it's not cheap. It costs something to do politics God's way. It costs something to live God's way. God had to give the best God had to provide God provide grace to us. So God had to give himself. Mm, yeah, glory. God had to be on Calvary dying and watching himself die at the same time. Yeah. No wonder the hymn writer said Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. And everybody who's ever stood with God, everybody who's ever stood in God's way, everybody who's ever learned God's way, the kingdom of heaven, from the prophets of the Bible to the, to the apostles, to those who try to stand with God today, you know it costs something. You can't be a lover without loving. You can't be a person of grace without showing grace. And especially when we live in a society built on plantation capitalism, built on any means necessary, it costs something to straighten out this vineyard called America. It costs something to lift those who've been broken and pushed away out. It costs something. According to the kingdom of heaven, it costs something. And if the church is going to follow Jesus, for instance, and show love to people and invite all into the love and grace of God, it's going to cost something. I don't care who you are. It costs something if you're going to serve the Lord, if you're going to be God and be God's people. And if a society that has had far too much denial around racism and sexism and inequality and homophobia and, and, and xenophobia, in order for us to fix this society, it's going to cost something. The owner knew that. But he also knew something else. It costs more not to live God's way. Than it does to do it God's way. <laughs> the politics of hell costs more than the politics of heaven. <laughs> Imagine if the nation had responded to COVID using God's politics, using the values of the kingdom of heaven. But because we didn't, it's costing us more than it had to. The Bible says, what doth it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their soul, lose their society? The cost is too high. If we don't address poverty in this country, the cost is too high. The whole country will unravel. You can't ignore over 50 percent of your people. The cost is too high. If we don't address systemic racism, racism is going to constantly tear us apart if the cost is too high. It will cost us the soul of this nation. Every time we fail to educate a child on the front side of life, it's going to cost us on the back side of life. Every time we refuse to provide health care for everybody, it's going to cost us. Every time we fail to love, love it's going to cost us in more hate. No wonder Francis of Assisi, that great, that great Franciscan, wrote and basically said, no matter what the cost, you've got to have some people that say, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. <laughs> It might be cost the Lord, but where there's hatred, let me show charity. Where there's injury, let me show pardon. Where there's error, let me show truth. Where there's doubt, let me be an instrument of faith. Where there's despair, let me be an instrument of hope. Where there is darkness, let me be an instrument of light. Where there is sadness, let me be an instrument of joy. Oh, divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled, but to console, to un be understood, but to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning, forgiving that we are pardoned. And it is in dying to ourselves that we are born again to eternal life. It costs us, but it costs more not to do it God's way. And then finally, this man not only used his power to hire these folk that needed it, he not used, only used his power to pay the cost to change the vineyard, he used his power to give a place for the pushed aside. The landowner's question was, are you envious 
because I'm generous? That's verse 15. Are you, you really mean you mad because I decided to do this God's way? You bothered because I've decided to, to help? Now, the translation there, y'all, if I can work a minute there, the translation of the Greek idiom there, it, is your eye evil because I'm good? Huh. Comes from the word ophthalmos, which, which we get ophthalmology. But it's ophthalmos ponerios or poneros. It means an evil eye. And what the, the, the landowner, what the vineyard owner is really saying is, you want me to have an evil eye. And Jesus taught us earlier that the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of life. But if your eye is unhealthy, ophthalmos, ponorios, if you got an evil eye, then your whole body, your whole nation will be full of darkness. Your whole church will be full of darkness. And so in this account, the evil eye was the opposite of generosity. You... (laughs) Are you envious because I'm generous? Uh, you, you want me to have an evil eye? You want me to be stingy? That's an evil eye. When I'm stingy, when I'm jealous, when I'm greedy, it means I don't even see what God has done. That's an evil eye. An evil eye is when people look down on others. An evil eye is when folks say others don't matter. An evil eye is when we push people aside. This land on a high is those nobody want to because he has God's eye, God's vision. Which means those, especially, watch this, those hired at five. And that's where the grace is in this text. Good God from Zion. It was grace all the way through. But when this landowner goes out at five o'clock, one hour before quitting time, and he hires the folk that are left, the ones that say, he says, why are you still here? And they say, because nobody wanted us. Good God from Zion. And so he hires them strictly by grace. They can't do anything for him, even if that was possible, with just one hour left. Oh, God, help me, Jesus. But he hires them because he's the landowner, because he's got some power, because God's been so gracious to him. And he hires them for what he can do for them. You see, in God's politics, you are seen based on your humanity, not how many hours you work. Have mercy, Jesus. You're seen based on the fact that you are a a, a creation of God. In God's kingdom, we are seen because by based on God's purpose, not our perfection. And when you are seen through the good eye of God, not the evil eye of the kingdom of hell, but the good eye of God of the kingdom of heaven, then God does some strange stuff. Y'all hear what I'm saying? God will do some strange stuff. God will do some strange stuff. Yes, God will. God will do some strange stuff. When God looks at us through God's eye. Hmm. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder one of the hymn writers said exceedingly, abundantly. Above all, all you can ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. God is able hmm, to do (laughs) just what he said he would do. And he's going to fulfill every promise in you. Don't give up on God. Because God won't give up on you. And when you're seen through the eyes of God, God won't give up on you. The first shall be last. And the last shall be first. When you're seen through the eyes of God. You know, when God looks at you, God will hire a Moses to be a prophet, though he has a murder on his record. That's God. That's the eye of God. God will hire an Esther to be a deliverer, even though she's been the victim of sexual abuse. That's, that's when God looks at God's eye. God will hire a little David to do a man's job, though he's a boy. When, when God looks at you through God's eye, God will take Shedrach, Meshach and Abednego to birth faith in an evil king's heart though they were eunuchs that had been castrated from their sexuality y'all don't hear what I'm saying God when when God looks at you through his eye God sees something he'll take a Rahab to save the spies from from prosecution though she was a sister caught up in prostitution y'all don't hear what I'm saying God when he looks at you God's eye God will take a Paul who was sick to see churches all through Asia Minor 
honor. When God looks at you through God's eye, the first become last and the last become verse. God will take Rosa Parks, a seamstress, and Fannie Lou Hamer uh, to set this nation called America straight. God, God, let me tell you what God will do. God will reach all the way over in the projects and bring a boy up to be a master for organist and a musician. When God gets his eye on you, God can hire a preacher. Some may have wanted to put down and put away and raise her up in prominent circles to proclaim the gospel. The eye of God will see something in you and hire you to serve the cause of God when you don't see anything in yourself but available. I stop by to tell you he's able. <laughs> he's able. And so I'm hallelujah glad of God's politics. I'm hallelujah glad when God does things right and when we get it and we try to do what God has called us to do because God is able and because God is able I'm glad that in God my beginning is not my end if y'all were here I'd say do I have a witness but right there wherever you are give me a witness back I'm so glad in the eye of God conditions can change positions can change situations can change in God's politics what's meant for evil can be turned to good in God's politics the last shall be first and the first shall be last in God's politics obstacles can be overcome pain can become power situations can shift in your favor in God's politics just hang around until the fifth hour just hang around until the grace hour grace G-R-A-C-E mercy M-E-R-C-Y both of them five letters just hang around until the grace hour because in God's God's politics through the eyes of God valleys can be exalted crooked places can be straightened out your personal drama can become powerful dreams sadness can be turned into joy in God's kingdom it's not over until God says it's over so hang in there don't give up on God. God won't give up on you. When God's got you, people can't vote you out. A party can't put you out. A president can't put you out. A deacon board can't put you out. Mean church folk can't put you out. A racist society can't put you out. In God's politics, when grace is at work, the first shall become last. And the last shall become first. How you know, Baba? Because I'm a witness. I was down. I was broken. I was depressed. I was hurting. Didn't think I mattered. But then, in the grace hour, God picked me with my crippleness. God picked me with my craziness. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. He's able. only politics I would trust ultimately is the politics of God. The only politics I would embrace ultimately if I was you is the politics of God. The only politics I would embrace is the politics of giving and the politics of love and the politics of mercy and the politics of grace because, because it costs too much to live the other way. It'll cost you your soul, it'll cost you society, but living God's way ultimately the vineyard will be shifted and ultimately those that have been pushed down will be lifted up and those who have been made to feel last will become first and when you become first you become first in love you won't become first in more oppression America you don't have to be afraid of a black folk rising up we ain't gonna do to you what you did to us shakarabo <laughs> soka I know you're afraid because you, you, you're projecting onto us the races. That's, that's what's going on. You're afraid. You know what you've done. You know the dirt you've done. 
And you see black women rising and black men and black children. And then when you see your children walking with folk, you taught them not to walk with. Hey, God of us. Mm. You're afraid, but, but we ain't going to become first like you were. Because we're not interested in having the vineyard to ourselves. We're not interested in doing what was done to us because it has cost you too much and we don't want to pay what you've had to pay. America has psychosis because of all the sin of slavery and racism. And in the church, in the church, those of you that are in churches and you happen to be officers, you don't have to be afraid with the folk in the street coming inside the church. (laughs) You don't have to be afraid of the church growing and us doing things different and reaching people different. No, you don't have to be afraid. There are folk, they, they don't want to be first in terms of oppression. They don't want to put you out. They just know there's enough grace for all of us. There's enough mercy for all of us. There's enough money for all of us. There's enough health care for all of us. There's enough resources for all of us. All we need is to see that the vineyard is not supposed to be a place of exclusivism and it's supposed to be a place where we have a whole different vision. The vineyard is supposed to be a place of growth and not grief, whether it's society or it's church. And so this morning, I pray, God, cast out of us in any way that evil eye. Cast away from us that eye that sees generosity as a bad thing. Cast out of us these fears. Perfect love cast out all fear. Cast out of us these fears that if somebody comes up, it means I got to come down. If somebody's healed, it means I have to be sick. No, 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 God, teach us that there's plenty of good room. There's plenty of good room in the kingdom of heaven both here on earth and yet to come. So God help us to begin what is yet to be. And though it may not be in perfection now, it only be in perfection then, let us begin now what is yet to be. The vineyard has been sick, but it doesn't have to be like that. The owners and the power structures have been too greedy, but it doesn't have to be like that. And this week, God, as we go in this convention, we're going to pray in ways for both of them. But let what we see happening not just be about partisan politics, but let what we see see happening hopefully be a sign not just symbolism because symbolism can just be that but a sign like a miracle is a sign to something happening greater so let it be a sign that something shifting that the vineyard can be changed equality justice and love can be great grace can be real now God for those in, that are hearing me who have felt last and who've been last let them know right now as they hear me praying this is grace moment this is five o'clock in the evening even if you thought earlier which was really not the true lord help them know that even if they thought earlier they had something to give to god let them know in this moment now god just wants you in all your self and all that you are god wants you God wants to give, wants you to have purpose, place, and provision. And I would say yes to the Lord. I would say don't give up on God. I'm a witness. He won't give up on you. Sanctify this word, God, that we not only might be, not only might we be hearers, 
but that we might also be doers of this word. Help us to say that deep in our heart. Lord, we will not give up on you because, Lord, you've never given up on us. We ask it in Jesus' name. And we give you thanks for every time you have hired us, called us, saved us, bought us, brought us by grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this time of Greenleaf Celebration, Justice, Love, and Action Ministry on the radio this evening. However, Elder Bell and Reverend Sher want to close us out. Write us on social media. Drop us a line at P.O. Box 597, Greenlee Christian Church, P.O. Box 597, Goldsboro, North Carolina. Thank you so much for your generous contributions. As you said, we don't do a lot of time asking for that, but thank you for everything you have done and every gift you have given, every way of grace you have shared. You can get this again and be broadcast. You can pull it up online. Call some folk and tell them that you heard about politics done right, God's way. Call somebody and let them know that grace is hiring. Hallelujah. Grace is looking for you. Grace is coming back again and again. No matter what hour, grace keeps coming back. Keeps coming back. Love you so much. God bless you. We are determined to show you the love of God. After this song, we're out of here for today. We never give a benediction on these broadcasts because we're just continuing. The, the benediction, the good word, is the word itself. And as soon as they finish singing, uh, our team will play something, and then we pray that you have a grace-filled day and that your Holy Ghost happy that this morning God decided to hire you by grace and woke you up this morning and started you on your way. Amen. Well, if it wasn't for the Lord, tell me what would I do? What would I do? Yeah. Tell me what would I do? Well, if it wasn't for the Lord, tell me what would I do? You know He's everything to me. Well, if it wasn't for the Lord, tell me what.